Well, good morning, everyone. Great. Um, I want to thank Jonathan for that uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, I also want to thank the Guild um, for uh, this particular conference and tackling what I think, as the panel pointed out yesterday, can be very difficult conversations uh, when we begin to really unpack what we're talking about when we talk about access and equity in education and in arts education uh, specifically. Um, this conference and the work that you all do and that we do at the uh, partnership is really founded on these two unassailable facts that we know about access and equity. Um, the first is, and Jonathan mentioned Arts Ed Search, where we have created a repository for the most high quality research about the benefits of learning in and through the arts for young people. We know this to be true through our own work, but it is confirmed by research about the academic and the cognitive and the social and the civic and the personal benefits in addition to the artistic mastery that comes through learning in and through the arts. That's one fact. And the second fact is, and is the focus of this conference, is that we know that there is inequitable access to that high quality education. Secretary Arne Duncan has referred to this, what he calls the opportunity gap, as a civil rights issue, as well as being an equity issue. And I think the panel yesterday really spoke to that. Because when we begin to talk about those inequities, who is it that we're talking about? What are the divides between the have and the have nots? And we heard yesterday that it is about race and ethnicity and class and culture and power structures that have a lot to do with that. And that it is disproportionately young people of color. And the panel yesterday challenged us to, to be more open in talking about those issues related to race, ethnicity, and income, and to be courageous in our conversations. That really resonated for me because at the partnership, we've had these, own, these conversations among our own staff. We are a diverse staff where there's six of us, but we are racially diverse. We also have different backgrounds. We have different Age, ages represent. I would say the one place where we're not diverse is in terms of gender. We have just one dude on our staff, of, but we'd like to have more. He brings a great perspective to that work. But this came up recently as we were talking about our own work because the mission of the partnership is to ensure that every child in America, every child, has access to a high quality arts education as part of a complete education and a balanced education. So we're very much focused on what we need to be doing to close that opportunity gap. And we were sitting around as a staff, the six of us talking about this because we're gonna make this our focus, a special focus over the next couple of years. And so we began talking about, well, wh what do we call this group of students and young people that are not getting access to the arts? And you know, we talked about uh, underserved students. You've heard that term used. We talk about students in need. We talk about disadvantaged students. We talk about students at risk. And one woman on our staff said, really, aren't we really talking about black and brown children? And the whole conversation changed when she raised that issue. And we began to talk more honestly about how we need to be bold in our own work and in our own conversations. And I would say the conditions under which those conversations occur have to be conditions in which there is mutual trust and respect 
among the people involved. And also empathetic listening, that we really have to understand the position that other people bring to this. And the panel talked about that yesterday, I think in extremely powerful ways. They talked about the importance of naming and framing the issues as they really are. And they talked about being able to talk about race and class and power structures as a first step, but also about meeting people where they are, particularly young people who are an asset in and of themselves rather than us trying to do something to someone to really take advantage of meeting people and understanding where they are at uh, as, instead of our, our own agendas. And I heard and learned a new phrase yesterday that I think will become part of my own lexicon, which is around targeted universalism. How do we ensure that there is joy and learning for all students, for all young people, and for all children. And I think that's the challenge that we, we face here. And lastly, we heard from the panel yesterday that we are all change agents. Every single one of us in this room has the power to make change. And that's what this panel is about today. It is about being the catalyst for change. And we have a phenomenal panel today that will be discussing this issue in very actionable and operationalizing ways of how we can be catalysts for change. And I'm going to introduce uh, each one of our panelists and invite them to come up, and then we're going to have a conversation. First, let me introduce to you Marita Irby. And Marita is the managing director for the Forum for Youth Investment in Washington, DC. Uh, Marita is actually the co-founder of uh, the Forum for Youth Investment, which was founded in 1998. She, along with Karen Pittman, um, are the founders there. And the forum is really focused on increasing the quantity and the quality of youth investment and in youth involvement in the US. Uh, the forum supports organizations and communities that invest in young people by promoting what they describe as a big picture approach to planning, to research, to advocacy, and to policy development among a broad range of organizations that can help communities invest in youth and children and families. Marita has also been a teacher, both in Central America and in some inner city schools in, in the US. So please join me now in welcoming Marita Irby to our panel. Now, Marita will be joined by Tom Deganey. And Tom's uh, hat that he wears, he is the Director of Cultural Affairs at the San Francisco Arts Commission. But prior to his work with the commission, he was an independent consultant for a while, facilitator and strategist in the field of arts and culture, youth development, and arts education. And many of you know Tom and have known Tom for a long time in his other role previously uh, for nine years as the executive director of the Performing Arts Workshop in San Francisco. And during his tenure there, Tom led three, I mean, this is big, three US Department of Education uh, research grants that examined the impact of the arts on disadvantaged youth and also organized coalition of local, state, and national levels for the role of the arts in improving education. He has presented extensively around the country on the promising practices in program and organizational development. And he currently serves on the California Alliance for Arts Education, their board of directors, and also their statewide policy council. So please join me now 
in, in asking Tom DeGaining joining, uh, joining us here on the panel. Now, rounding out our panel, we have Ayana Hudson. And Ayana, as of I think July, if I'm not mistaken, uh, became the Director of Arts Education at the National Endowment for the Arts. And I'm personally quite thrilled about that because the endowment is one of our uh, sponsoring organizations at AEP, so Ayana is on our governing council as well. And at NEA, as the Director of Arts Education, Ayana now presides over the grant portfolio that's devoted to arts education. She works with the national service organizations on policy issues, and she also serves as the spokesperson for arts education at the federal level. And prior to coming to the NEA, Ayana served for over 10 years as the Director of Arts Education with the Los Angeles County of the uh, Los Angeles County Arts Commission. While she was there under her tenure, she developed and led the implementation of the Arts for All Collaborative. And that was focused on ensuring equitable access for, to arts education for, get this, 1.6 million students in the counties, LA counties, 81 school districts. It is the largest system in the nation. And while she was there and leading this effort, the Arts for All Collaborative has been recognized nationally as well as their research being cited. So it's had a tremendous impact on our thinking about access and equity. She is also a widely sought after uh, speaker and expert in the field of arts education. So join me now in welcoming Ayana Hudson. Now, I'm going to move over here and join the panel and start with our first round of questions. And just like yesterday, you have note cards on your chairs for your questions and as we go along. And I believe Ken will bring up those questions to us. So be listening and put your questions down and make sure that they get up here so we can ask them in, in the time that we have. Okay, uh, we're going to start with, uh, with Marita. Um, now, Marita, I'm intrigued by this big picture approach and working with multiple organizations and working not just with one system, but multiple systems. So I'm gonna ask you if you can unpack that for us and then specifically tell us how do we ensure that the arts are part of the conversation and as we as leaders and practitioners in arts education are at the table for those conversations. Um, and we, we talked a little bit, I'm gonna share a few slides um, that we talked about as we were prepping for today, but I just wanna start by saying one of the reasons I'm so excited about being here, and Jonathan knows this, but I don't think I told you, Sandra, um, is in addition to being a, an eighth grade teacher myself once upon a time and teaching choir, my mother, mother, who's now retired, was for 45 years an arts teacher. And when we were, when this came up of the, could you join this conversation? I was like, well, yes. I, mother would not let me pass this one by. So I'm very, very excited to be here. I just wanted to pick up, kind of coming out of yesterday's conversation, this, the, the work that we do in, at the forum with communities across the country really are trying to bring the range of folks together in communities to talk about how we improve the full range of outcomes for children and youth. And when we're talking about these kind of community change conversations, fundamentally they really are about equity. Oftentimes, we try to kind of play tic-tac-toe with our young people. If you can see it, there's a little tiny print up there. But we tend to have the kind of, for low risk, or you know, kids that we think are okay, tend to have more kind of the low risk or enrichment sorts of services. And then for the high risk, they get the high risk kinds of services. 
But what we really know about how people grow and develop is that at some point in your life you need a little bit of all, and that the things that make the most different, often for the young people that are kind of targeted or labeled as at risk, is the kind of engaging, performance-oriented, I can demonstrate impact, making a difference kinds of things that you do in arts education. So just wanted to start off with that one a little bit, connecting yesterday's conversation into today, is that we are basically trying to figure out how we stop playing tic-tac-toe with our young people, but really look at young people from a, a, a whole person, whole child kind of approach in terms of the work that we're doing, and have that be the focus for how we come together as communities in this work. Families are trying to make sense out of all the range of resources that are out there. Oftentimes our approach is, and kind of business as usual, is that you kind of identify a problem and you find, you kind of identify some funding and, and then throw a solution at it. And it ends up kind of leading to a little bit of a mess. I want to show you this next slide from a real community that tried to map the range of services and supports that are out there. And oh my goodness. If a typical family was trying to make sense out of that, it's a little tiny print across the top, it's sort of education, health and food, social services, all these different systems that you're also trying to work with as well in terms of your work. And how do we make sure this, these are connecting to families? How, does that, how do, um, as, as educators working with families, do you even know the kinds of resources that might be available and how to make sense out of that? It sort of becomes this kind of spaghetti bowl. Um, and, and how do we look at it? That is one of the fundamental things that communities across the country, many of the communities you're working in, are really looking at how do we kind of change that, that picture and that way of doing business. And the next slide, thank you, Bobby. Um, the, the way that, that, that we're, many of us are tackling this, whether you call it collective impact or community change or all these kinds of things, and really being that kind of change catalyst that Sandra's talking about, is how do you really start with the end in mind? What are the goals? get specific about the resources that are there, and then really change the way that we're doing business as leaders in communities to do this kind of work. The question that we are talking about today is how, as arts educators, are we making sure that we are a part of that conversation, that we're helping to shape those conversations, shape those goals, and really be at the table when decisions are getting made. And we're gonna be kind of framing that up in the conversation this morning and getting very specific in the work that we're all doing in places to make that happen. So just teeing it up quickly, um, on the next one, what, what, what are we really talking about? We're talking about young people that are ready. What are the outcomes that we're looking for? Oftentimes, especially in this country, we focus in on kind of the middle, if you think about kind of a, a bullseye, a target, we kind of focus in on a middle in terms of academics and making sure that young people are academically and vocationally prepared. And we also really want to be able to reduce kind of risks and make sure that they're physically and emotionally safe. But we know that that's not all of the picture. There's a missing kind of piece that often doesn't get measured, it doesn't get focused on. It's really about how young people are being socially and civically, culturally, as we saw this morning with the, the Ballet Folklorico, really connected as part of the development picture. So the question that we've been talking about in terms of, of the work that you all are doing is how do you really make sure that art, artistic development is a part of the picture but also really be effective, and I know it's so much of what you do in your work, of making the case for how the arts actually help with those other outcomes. That they really, just in that kind of middle, middle ring there, the, the kind of second ring out, the socially, civically connected, culturally connected, those are things that we know make a difference in terms of academics, we know they make a difference in terms of avoiding risks. How do we show that we're really a central part of this picture, not an add-on? That's one of the key things, is coming to tables and communities to frame these discussions when people are setting those goals and, and the indicators they wanna measure and all of that. How do we make sure that that's part of the, um, not an add-on, but a central part of the equation? Can we look at the next one? And then, who's coming together in communities? Another view, looking at children and youth at the center, and then saying, who are the people that need to be at the table? This is a tool that we often use when communities are trying to say, um, who should be a part of a community coalition? And they'll start off with some, you know, some typical, sub, some, some um, expected kind of um, systems and, and sectors to be around the table. And then we often say, well, who's not a part of this picture? And, and folks will say, well, where, where are the cultural groups? Where are the libraries? Where are the museums? We didn't invite them yet. Um, we didn't think that maybe they were a part of this discussion. How do you help make sure if these things are happening in communities that you're actually a part of that work? And 
as Sandra was saying, what are all the systems that are out there that, that really the work that you do is, is, is key to helping them do the primary work that they care about, all the different places where, where this work carries out. Another view of it, it's really a little bit more of an education centric view, a major system, how do we connect to, and this is the next one that people have this sense of an education pipeline, the P20 kind of councils that are happening in communities, cradle to career um, coalitions that are taking place in communities. And if we look at this next picture, it sort of frames that if we, we oftentimes as people are doing that work, really just focus on the middle, the kind of education, traditional education pipeline. But what we know is one, there are gaps in that pipeline, kids fall through the gaps, and two, to be able to, to kind of help keep them in and going through, you need a little insulation around that pipeline. Um, there are learning and engagement supports and a range of systems and supports that are out there trying to, to be supportive of that education pipeline. And where do we fit in terms of that picture uh, as well, in terms of saying who should be at the table and who's really helping to provide critical supports in communities. So in that kind of first layer of insulation is so, as well as in the schools themselves, is so much of the work that we do. Uh, and then you also have this outer layer that's really kind of the basic services piece of the picture. In drawing pictures like that, we, people are, in, again, increasingly coming together to say, how do we connect this together in a more coherent way, really focused together on the goals in that, in that target that we were looking at? Um, but even in communities, in terms of the coalitions and things, people tend to have this idea of, you know, we, we pick an issue and then we'll pull everybody together in the big tent to tackle that issue. I'm just curious, how many of you are part of kind of arts education coalitions in your communities? How many of you are part or connected to a coalition that's focused on something when in the name other than arts? And how many of you are focused on, or how many of you are actually part of more than say five coalitions? in your community? More than six? More than seven? More than 10? We have winners over here with seven. Oftentimes there's a, oh, we have a 10. We have more than 10. You're very active in your community life, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of work that's going on in communities and increasingly there are these kind of cradle to career sorts of efforts that are trying to help think about how to connect the dots. Why? Next slide, business as usual when it comes to coalitions. This is another community map. This is a county um, up in New York State that was basically actually trying to make sense of all the difference. You'll see arts up there if you looked at the small print, all the different kinds of coalitions by name in a community. People have a sense that we need to come together. And it's not that we don't have some work to do on our own to be able to move issues, but how do we come together and actually try to make a little bit more sense about that picture as a whole. We look at this next picture, I, I have some real views of this, um, but this is a very simplified view um, of what commu some communities are looking at, of how to be able to have some partnerships and actually have them connect in a little bit more of a coherent way around the goals that we're caring about, whether it's looking at early childhood and, and school age and older youth and, and, um, and looking at kind of college career connectedness or looking at very specific issue coalitions and how do they connect in. Uh, and if anybody's interested or we have more time, I can show you maps from places like Atlanta and others that really have looked at the intentional connections and, and it's almost like a, a virtual kind of infrastructure in the community for bringing about change when it's looking at making things better for children and youth. Um, so just kind of wrapping up with this piece and then and turning over to uh, my colleagues up here, if we just look at one more, I think that's up here, that we just wanted to kind of set as the starter of it. Yes, we need to start with the end in mind when we think about the kind of the arts education, how are we making sure that we're really part of the picture? Is Bobby still over there? That we connect to the goals, um, that we really are seen as key supports when people are drawing those community maps of who's out there doing this work, and that that we really are linking to some of the key decision-making tables that are out there. And as we have some of the discussion this morning, we can get, we're gonna get more concrete about how we're really influencing that and being, and being change agents in our communities and where these kinds of activities, these kind of collective efforts are happening that were central to the conversation, um, especially in policy conversations when it comes to things like quality and other things where it's like, what does good look like? We know a lot about that in arts education. We can bring something key to that table and need to be in the, in the midst of the conversation um, as it's going forward. 
Great. Thank you, Marita. That is extremely helpful, I think, in understanding that we're not just talking about one system, we're talking about multiple systems and how they interact with one another. Uh, the idea that we would start with the ends in mind and thinking about our role as arts educators and arts leaders to be part of these conversations, not just as an add-on, but as really part of the solution uh, and helping us to think about how we might map out all those different relationships. I want to turn to you, Tom, next because um, you have a couple of different perspectives uh, to bring to this uh, now with a uh, city organization, but also with the Performing Arts Workshop previously. So I want to get a little more concrete now um, and ask you uh, in terms of what lessons you have learned and what people can do. I particularly would um, ask you also, because I think one of the things we get sometimes confused about is about our role as advocates. Many of us don't think about ourselves as being advocates and advocates when it comes to policy issues. That feels oftentimes uncomfortable and you have um, had a lot of experience in working at those, those different levels. So share with us, if you can, thinking about the, the sort of the framework that Marita has laid out for us, what kind of concrete actions can we take to make sure we are part of the conversation and we are impacting what's happening in our community, but we're also having a bigger impact as advocates and for policy change as well? Certainly. Well, first, I want to thank the Guild for putting the issue of cultural equity front and center um, throughout the conference and here on the main stage. I think this is a civil rights issue, and um, having been recently at the Grant Makers and the Arts Conference in Miami, this is a conversation throughout the arts and I think throughout education. So I think it's a critical time for us to be moving this conversation forward and defining ways in which we are going to be moving that change forward. So I thank the Guild for doing that for us this week. Um, I think in defining what advocacy is and why it's important to engage in advocacy, um, I used to think of advocacy um, as storytelling and telling our story. But I think now that I have moved into the policymaker side of things, I see it much more about advocacy is listening. Um, and how we are listening to uh, where there is need and the desires and needs that policymakers are defining and how we begin to influence change. Um, so looking at spheres of influence, and I think why cultural equity is such an important conversation is not just in arts and education, but we're really looking at the distribution of wealth in our society. I mean, this is, in my opinion, what the Occupy movement is about. This is what um, our conversations in the race for president are about. We are talking about how we distribute wealth in our society. And so we have to look at where the influences are, influences are in terms of how we influence change and bringing people to the table for that conversation. So I think about that and um, one of the first areas of influence I feel that it's closest to us are our philanthropic partners. Um, we, uh, there's a report recently that came out from the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy um, entitled Fusing Arts, Culture, and Social Change by Holly Sidford. Um, it clearly articulates the return on investment when funders make an investment in funding advocacy. And I know having run a nonprofit that more often than not those people investing in our work who are distributing wealth to us in our work as change agents are interested in the direct service towards the individual young person. So I think trying to understand better how we can first have a conversation with those people who are our partners and investors who believe in the work we're doing and helping them better understand why investing in your time at a school board meeting or your time at a coalition meeting or why sitting down with rec and park staff who are working on recreation issues for young people and youth development issues, why that's important work and it deserves to be funded 
is one of the very first spaces where I think we can start to have an influence, is to make sure when you're meeting with your foundation program officer, when you're bringing people in to see your program, you talk about partnerships and ways in which collective action are a part of the work that you do. And don't undersell it, and don't undersell the value and the cost on your salary's time, your organizational's time. It should be a part of your budget. You know, it needs to be really, I think, embedded in our work. Um, and until we do that, we're going to be at a disadvantage because it's going to be something you feel like you do in your spare time. Um, and I think we need to move that more central to our organizational structures, um, to how we budget, how we have those conversations internally, and articulating the outcomes we want to have and what um, participation we're going to have in the policy framework. Um, so with that, I just want to ask how many people here have had a conversation one-on-one -on -one with a member of your school board or an elected official in the past year? Good, that's great. How many people um, have presented at your school board in a more formal fashion or in a broader community setting? Sure. Great. I, you know, I was going to do an activity to ask everybody to get online and actually pull up your school board website and find that agenda. But I think one thing I, will, I would recommend to people to do and to have your staff do is get that onto your Outlook calendar. Make sure that these um, action points in which uh, decision makers make decisions know the budget cycle. Put the budget cycle in your agency's calendar for your city and for your school board. Know exactly when that happens every year and program around and incorporate that schedule into your programming calendar. If you're working with young people or doing site visits, time it in a way that you're having influence so that it's not just um, the school district's uh, school calendar that often dictates all of us, <laughs> as it often does, um, but that we're starting to look at the ways in which we program for influence and, and how do we um, kind of bring that influence forward. So, and a lot of it, I think, is scheduling and showing up. Um, one of the interesting things moving into a policy making and decision making role is I am shocked at how few members of the community come before us um, and how then only a few voices, and in my opinion not the most representative voices, often the people with the most free time, frankly, let's be honest, um, are the ones who are there influencing policy. If we want to be at the table and influence policy, I think a lot of times I hear, you know, well, business has so much influence, we have to get business at the table. Um, I, you know, we really have to be listening to how we are partnering and where we show up. Um, and that does mean showing up at your chamber meeting as well as your school board meeting. So that you're listening and understanding kind of what issues and economic development they're dealing with and knowing what your partners in the economic, de uh, economic development arena on the ground are doing. I think economic development work at a community level is one of our greatest partners on um, reforming education and the role of arts in education. Um, and oftentimes, offices of economic development have much larger budgets than arts commissions or um, arts programs. And there are resources there to access for our programming in the arts to demonstrate, to utilize and kind of grow our influence. So, I think those are just a few of the ways um, um, to kind of recap that, you know, working with our philanthropic partners to understand the importance of investing in advocacy work, um, in our listening, in terms of engaging partners and moving towards collective action, and then really showing up and really tangibly finding ways to embed advocacy into our organizations. Advocacy, when it is storytelling, is something we do every day. We advocate to a funder. We advocate to our boards of trustees and directors. We are excellent advocates, and every one of us in this room didn't get where you are. You're not here because you didn't advocate for somebody to put this in the travel budget. So I think we all have that toolkit. Um, it's just utilizing it in a way that is looking at where we want to have influence. Thank you, Tom. I, you know, it, it seems to me that what you're reminding us to do is to be more intentional in our actions rather than waiting for things to come to us and then being in a reactive mode. You're uh, telling us that we need to be more proactive and very intentional in the way we go about being part of those, those conversations. And that listening piece, I think, is very important when we're talking about how we can influence change. We can be part of the solution. Um, 
so let me turn now to you, Ayana, because you also bring a very interesting perspective to this conversation at the local level with Arts for All and the LA County Arts Commission, and now in your new role at the federal level. So as you have traveled around the country, uh, both in your previous role, but more importantly now, I think you've been out meeting with uh, lots of people and also working with grantees and so forth. What are some of the themes that you see emerging? And importantly, what are some of the promising practices that we see that can really help move the needle on the issue of access and equity, not just in arts education, but in education more generally for all children. Thank you, Sandra. Right. Hi, everybody. It's so good to be here and to see uh, old colleagues and old friends and look forward to lots of dialogue and conversation over the course of the conference and making new friends as well as my honor and sincere pleasure to be here with you all this morning. So when I think about, you know, this theme of, of equitable access, you know, we're really talking about all students receiving a high quality and excellent education in dance, music, theater, and the visual arts. Um, and for me, in terms of what I've learned, both in LA County and my new role at the federal level, I, I think about this issue a lot. And what does this really mean? And it's, you know, how to, really building on the, the themes and the conversation that is taking place today, to, to, this morning, how do we move out of having this um, isolated impact and working in a more narrow kind of focus to really impacting and changing whole systems. You know, when we're working individually, we're working with a targeted focus group of students. And when I think about equitable access, uh, I think about all students and how do we impact and change the systems that are serving those students? How do we impact and change whole school systems, whole school districts, and whole communities? Of course, this is a hugely audacious goal, right? Um, and it's really, again, building off of the theme, this is a goal that is too big for us to solve by ourselves and too big for us to work in isolation. So we have to think strategically, we have to think super big, and we have to think really, really bold in terms of how we're gonna move forward collectively. So again, building off of the work that was happening that continues to happen in LA County, um, working across 81 school districts and now really thinking nationally and broadly, I've had the um, benefit of really working with learning from many statewide initiatives that are taking place um, across the country that are also really thinking about and pushing that envelope forward in terms of equitable access for all students for arts education. So Sandra asked me to really think about, you know, what are the kind of common factors that we see? So I think about work that's happening at the local level in places like LA County, right here in Dallas in terms of the Big Thought Initiative, Chicago, Ingenuity Incorporated, and then thinking about statewide initiatives too, statewide work happening across North Carolina. Um, I'm sure people are familiar with the A plus schools model, which is also in Oklahoma, Arkansas, moving into Louisiana. Um, thinking about um, ABC schools in South Carolina, um, whole schools initiative in Mississippi, Connecticut, Tennessee, Idaho, Maryland, there are statewide initiatives happening across the country. And so when we really examine why are those initiatives successful? Why are they having an impact, as Sandra said, and really kind of moving the needle? I think there's some really important lessons that we can learn and some trends that we can really begin to see merge across all of these programs. So I think one of the biggest lessons that we can learn in terms of you know, how do we begin to really impact the systems, we know that systems change is driven by data. And I think at the fundamental basic level, when you peel it all back, it all boils down to the data. What do we know about which students have access to arts education? And I think it's hard to um, to move forward, to even know where you want to go and what you want to address if you don't know what's in place and what that baseline data is. 
where um, is a school really now thinking about K-12 arts education, a school or a district, what are their strengths in terms of curriculum and instruction and professional development? How are they allocating current resources? Who are the, uh, Marita talked about mapping the partnerships, who are the current partnerships that um, that's working with the school or the district? Really identifying what the strengths are, but also the opportunity to identify where are the gaps where if we know we want to get to 100% equitable access, where are we along that, that spectrum? And really using data to, to help us to, um, to inform those decisions. And I think, you know, when I think about the role of um, an arts organization in that, Marita and Tom really talked about this kind of coalition building. And Sandra talked about, you know, we are the, the change agent. So if something isn't in place in your community, how can you, um, build the broad coalition to bring many different voices together to um, get an audience with the school board member, with the superintendent, to really drive this conversation forward, starting at the very basic level again of the data collection. How can you be part of that team of business leaders, of school board members, of, of principals, of teachers, of artists, of parents coming together to really have a um, a real, true, raw conversation about what services and what the education is gonna look like for students. So being part of that team to actually collect the data that's so important to be able to make decisions moving forward. And one of the other points I wanna underscore about data, data of course establishes the, the baseline of where you are. And when we really talk about moving the needle, how do you know the progress that you've made? How do you know where you need to readjust along the way? You keep checking back into that data, so that data piece is um, super, super important. I think the other kind of big trend that emerges across statewide work and other local work that's happening is once you have the data, really using the data to drive planning and to drive um, strategies for how you're gonna impact whole systems. So a plan, of course, and going through a planning process provides an opportunity working within a broad, cross-sector, diverse coalition to develop a shared vision of where you wanna go, really a common agenda, um, getting all on the same page, really getting in and examining that data and identifying, again, what are the strengths, what are the gaps, and how do you develop a roadmap then using the data of how you're gonna move forward to get to this goal of equitable access and all students learning in and through the arts and dance, music, theater, and the visual arts. This is also an opportunity, I think, again, building on a, a theme and a trend um, between um, my two other panelists, is really this is an opportunity to understand what are the other needs of um, the school district? How do you um, use this planning process and the data to really have fundamental conversations and to understand, because you are part of this team now, what are the broader um, needs of the school district and how can you have um, strategic conversations about, this is what we know to be true about arts education in this school, in this district, in this community. What are the broader needs of the district? And how can we begin to connect those dots? And how can the arts be um, an effective partner in helping the school or the district of the community to really drive um, and to meet other goals that they may have for, um, for students? So again, in terms of um, the arts organization really being at the table and being part of those conversations where decisions are being made and where um, resources are being allocated to drive an agenda forward. Also being part of the planning process really helps one to understand how the work you're doing now can fit into a broader, larger strategy. Again, this idea of moving out of um, working in isolation and connecting your work to something that is um, a larger strategy. And so you have a better idea now of how to align your work to support the broader strategies and goals of a district, of a school, of a community. The other thing I think we can learn across community-wide coordinated delivery systems, thinking about statewide models, is there's no competition between discrete, discrete instruction and integrated instruction. 
um, initiatives that are working to impact systems and to embrace all youth in terms of this holistic model of arts education. Really thinking about the role of classroom teachers in integrating the arts, the role of specialists in teaching the arts, and of course, the very important role of arts organizations and teaching artists as a key component of this holistic model of arts education. So getting out of um, the, the bickering, really, that we have in our field of one versus the other, really one of the trends and what we can learn is that we all need to work collectively together, and when you have a strategy, you can carve out a role and a place for everyone. Again, the job is too big, and we have too much work to do, but there's a place for each one of us to, to move it forward. Um, the other piece that I want to highlight, I think, in terms of what we can learn, um, you know, when we think about data, we think about the plan and where we want to go, and we know that we need this holistic model of instruction. One of the other areas across these initiatives is this idea of building capacity and really leadership development um, for all teachers, principals, district, and community leaders. And I think the operative word here is really all. Um, m moving us out of this idea of serving one group of teachers who kind of self-select to participate in um, professional development, but thinking about how do we impact all teachers in a school? How do we impact all district leaders? How do we impact community leaders? Again, thinking about the systems in which we are working and the systems which are impacting students. So thinking about the data, thinking about the plans, how do we now um, well, what would it look like to come together in collaborative consortias to really think about serving all teachers in a district? Um, what are the needs that the district or the school may have in terms of driving this agenda for equitable access? And again, how can you be a key partner and align the very critical and valuable services that we can provide um, as an arts community, as a key player at the table, but again, not working in isolation, thinking about the broader picture, forming our own coalitions, and really driving this agenda of serving all teachers. And that's really one of the, um, the best practices that we can learn from other initiatives as well. I'm not sure if people are familiar with Michael Fullen's work um, and choosing the wrong drivers for whole system reform, but this is one of the pieces that he talks about in terms of in order to really impact systems, we're not talking about serving one teacher or two teachers or three teachers, we're talking about impacting all teachers across a, distri a district or across the system. Um, I want to highlight a couple other quick things, what we can learn again across all these initiatives. Each one of these initiatives is really evaluating and measuring their work. Um, not just evaluation to evaluate your work, but really looking constantly at data to see where are we moving the needle, where are we not moving the needle, and how can we make adjustments along the way. Um, I know in LA County, one of the tools that we put in place was something called Arts Education Performance Indicators, um, which the name was supposed to be aligned to the um, AEPI, the Academic Performance Index that the state of California has. So we had AEPI and really established these kind of just five critical success factors that our broad coalition constantly, uh, every year, every other year, were surveying school districts and we were looking at that data constantly to see where were we having an impact, where were we not having an impact. But um, using that as a um, um, unifying um, system in terms of the data to keep, again, to keep checking back in. And there's agreement of how we're going to do that. But I think the big idea here is to use the data to constantly improve your work and to see how the, the needle is moving. Um, the last point that I want to highlight in terms of, again, looking across the spectrum nationally and thinking locally as well, that one of the key, key factors of the success in these various initiatives is the establishment of a backbone support organization. 
So I think to really impact systems and to impact kids, and that's what we're, we're talking about here in terms of really getting to the essence of equitable access for students. We know from our experience and we know from research that there is an entity in place usually that makes sure that all the partners and all the strategies continue to move forward and that everything is aligned to the overall strategy that has been put in place. Um, this entity also ensures com continuous communication and ongoing dialogue across partners and the broad coalitions that have been established. And in, a, in terms of the arts organization, really thinking about if something doesn't exist like this in your community, does your organization have the capacity to take on this leadership role? And that's really what it's about, leadership, and it's about making sure and understanding that we are the change that um, that um, we want to embody and that we want to see. So it really determining, do I have the capacity to take this on? If not, is there another entity in my organization that is suited to do this? But that's really one of the critical success factors across all these initiatives, that there is, um, while there are multiple players and multiple partners, you need something that's keeping everything grounded and keeps, um, keeps everything moving forward. When we think about the work taking place here in Dallas, Big Thought really serves as kind of that managing partner. In LA County, Arts for All, LA County Arts Commission kind of served as that managing partner. In Chicago, with their work that's taking place to ensure equitable access, Ingenuity Incorporated really serves as kind of that managing partner. So really think about, um, is that a role that I can take on in my community to really um, provide the leadership to create the, the broad coalition and the broad sectors to then really engage in the various steps that I outlined in terms of really thinking about how can we impact the systems that are serving youth. That's an excellent question, effective advocates. I want to underscore Ayana's point about the importance of evaluation and data. Um, a, a lot of us don't think about that until we're toward the end of some of our work. And it's so important to build that in at the front end to establish that kind of baseline as in terms of where we are. That's the only way in which we can measure progress and improve our practice over time to see what is working and what is not working. And that's the kind of evidence I think that is so powerful with decision makers and other influencers uh, and elected officials in terms of really recognizing the role that we all play uh, in ensuring a well-rounded and complete education for every child that includes the arts. Um, with that sort of background and platform and strategies and tactics in mind, I want to turn to a couple of very excellent questions that we have from the audience that I think take us down a little bit deeper. Um, and this is a very, um, uh, this question to me strikes me as a very nuts and bolts kind of question. So this is to any of you. Uh, many of the large scale arts initiatives focus on exposure and basic training for younger children. And the question is, is how can we scale or scale up these highly impactful teen years programs that are often more specialized and advanced and uh, more specialized and advanced? And how can we create a deeper experience for also smaller numbers of youth, you know, say 30 to 180? So really, what can it mean for our, some of the work that our individual organizations have? How do we make, translate some of this for those teen programs. Start with, big, start with big picture and then we'll get like more concrete. But, but one of the things, you come back to the data word that, that we have found is, especially in the teen years, there, there's, there's such a drop off of, um, of numbers in terms of, of uh, who's com coming to the programs and the availability of the programs. But when we're talking about some of these late, these tables where some of the agendas get set and the and the resources get get allocated, there's not an awareness really of how much that's a part of the picture. And so what we found in places where they've been able to come with the data to the table and and paint it as basically a um, an access question and and a a kind of 
just gaps in terms of what's happening with time in the teen years that that it's it's sort of it's making the case for and what are what's going to be able to fill in those gaps and so it's it's again it kind of comes back to before there's there's scale in terms of just programming and again I'm happy to let my colleagues up here speak to this a little bit more but in terms of just being able to make the case for why we need some of these things to go to scale when people start looking at the just huge gaps in terms of numbers of young people that are out there and who don't have access to any of this, it, po it just starts to pose the question in a different way. So being able to bring that data to a broader set of community stakeholders and, and, and do in some of the ways that we've been talking about, be able to make the case for that, I think it's one of the key things for how to take those things to scale. And what I'll, I'll just say, in the, in the communities, you're talking about the backbone support kind of um, organizations and, and how they're sort of managing partners within and within coalitions around specific things like arts education. What we'll find in many communities is that there's a coming together of those, of the different coalitions, almost a coalition of coalitions to be able to do some of this work. Um, or you find those organizations in mayor's offices or United Ways or, or, um, in, or school districts taking the lead. But when I've gone into work with a lot of the groups at, at sort of that top level leadership, again, when they say, well, who do we need to bring to the table? They're not, they're not automatically thinking, unless there's a really robust out of school time system, they're not automatically thinking arts educators. And so I think one of the ways to help take some of these things to scale is to, to look around in your community and see who's, is there something like that going on at the really big picture level that, that you're not represented at and that you're not, you're not being seen as part of the solution when they're saying, you know, well, wow, what are we gonna do? There's a lot of gap. Um, in terms of the, the supports we're providing, the opportunities we're providing for young people. And, and if you're not in the room, it's, it's gonna be hard for people to realize that you could be a part of the solution and be at the table when resources are, are being moved that could help take some of your work to scale. I would just add that in terms of considering scaling your program to really start with the needs assessment and a real honest assessment of whether in terms of equi equity and access, could you provide that program to every student? And not to say that equity is always every student. Sometimes it means redirecting resources to those students who've historically not received them. So perhaps looking at that scale, I know in San Francisco, the Arts Education Master Plan, we identified that middle schools had historically been underserved in arts specialists. So the school district dedicated money from a, a Prop H measure, which was a funding measure to support our Arts Education Master Plan, and we directed a large majority of that money to arts specialists in middle school because that was the gap we found in the needs assessment. So I think if you're a private partner, really thinking about where's that needs assessment, where do you fit in and round out that kind of big picture, and if that is at the teen level or you know high school level, but knowing that ahead of time so that you're not, it, it, you know, understanding is it driven by your growth desires as an organization um, or is it driven by the kind of real assessment of the district or this youth you might be serving. Um, I'll just throw in a piece that I want to mention earlier, but it comes to this point of bringing equity to scale. Um, and another strategy we've talked about at the California Alliance for Arts Education at our policy council, not so much for the Alliance, but in general, is this issue of litigation. There is another whole tool to driving change in our society, and we're fortunate to have a, a different branches of government. But in California, we've seen a couple of cases brought forward by sports um, inequities, particularly in Southern California and Orange County, where lawsuits have been brought by the ACLU because of the lack of access and equity to a, a complete education in the area of sports and actually some issues on nutrition. So I think another thing to throw into our advocacy toolkit is when we're working in alliances and we're looking at scale, if we hit barriers to change along the way, that's always, us, you know, if we feel that this is a civil rights issue, um, we shouldn't forget our potential partners partnerships with um, agencies like the ACLU who really are there to help uh, take on some of these cases if inequity continues to persist. And I, I bring that up because I think that's really when you're talking scale at a statewide system or even a district level. Important to remember. Uh, we only have about three minutes left, I'm saying this, which, you know, you'd bring me a stack of questions and then, so, uh, but I really wanna ask this question. So this is gonna be a little bit of a lightning round for our, our panelists and I'm gonna combine two of these questions. Um, the first is a very direct question. Um, are we still talking about giving brown and black children access to the arts? 
And this other question that came in is, um, I, I think one for me personally, I, I want to get your feedback on, how can we talk about, um, or can you talk about the sort of deficit model and thinking about whether or not it's important to change the language around how we identify and label young people. I mentioned our own dilemma at the partnership of what terms do we use? Is it disadvantaged, doesn't feel right? Is it at, uh, at risk? Well, you know, that implies that it's the kid's fault. But we, we have these um, problems with what to call this group that we're trying to serve and our question about are we still talking about black and brown children? I would say one of the challenges has been to kind of turn that deficit model on its head and to ask ourselves, what does it look like? What does it look like? Would we provide the best education to all of our children? But we still don't have that language. And so I want to ask you very quickly, can you, can you help us with that? I know, Tom, you had a comment about that in terms of how we even use the, the words around access and equity and does that have meaning for people outside of our field or outside the field of education. But help us think about our, our language to really have those kinds of courageous conversations that we need to be having. Yeah, I, a great teaching artist once had a phrase at Performing Arts Workshop, the power of the particular and naming the very specific thing you're asking for in, in kind of in creative writing or elsewhere. So I think to this point about who we're talking about, is it's, it has to be very particular. Um, and I think one of the messaging lessons we learned at Performance Workshop was that um, the primary message of equity is broadly interpreted. Almost anybody can kind of put themselves in an equity frame and feel like something in their experience is not equitable. If you're talking very specifically about a school and for me, it's a lot about income. Um, and I think we see a lot of uh, kind of interchanges around race and class in terms of inequity. But if you're looking at one school and you compare it to another school, and this is where the data comes in, you need that data to show what this school gets, what this school doesn't get. And in the messaging framework we worked in, it's like, this is not fair. This school, which is predominantly African-American and has parents who work every day and cannot fundraise in the same way that this school, which is predominantly white and whose parents have mobilized to ensure that young people there get an arts education, that that is not fair and that you're taking that fight to your school board or if you, no one's listening to the ACLU. And I just want to echo and underscore what you just said because I've seen in my own work that um, real data where you sit around um, with a group of principals across the district examining data about who has access and who doesn't and the data brings to the data tells the story the data brings to light these title one schools don't have access these title one schools or these other schools do have access but the data then so, so you're not coming from um, um, strictly from your passion, which we all need to bring to the table, but the data gives you the concreteness, um, the, the proof in the discussion. And I think from there, because when you have the data and the, and the conversation of not fair, I've, I've seen um, even superintendents get that. They get, well, it's not right that these students over here have something and these students over here don't. And parents, of course, get that. Why do my kids not have something that somebody else has? Um, so I, I just want to bring it back again to the data because the data can really underscore and point out in very real stark terms who has access, who doesn't, has ac who do, who doesn't have access, but now what are we going to do about it? And how are we going to address the very real issues that have been raised in the data? So I think we've gotten a lot of good feedback and information, again, tactics and strategies. Uh, a very wise individual uh, came up with the term of we are the change. And we, in fact, are the change agents to make something happen, to take actionable 
steps to address these issues through our own naming and framing and through our honest conversations. So I'm going to leave you with that today. I think our panelists are going to be around. We do have some additional questions that I'll share uh, with them as well. But please join me now in thanking Marita, Tom, and Ayana for their conversation today.